If you'd like to turn to 1 Timothy 3.15, that's where we'll be taking our first request from, that there would be a good understanding among all believers about how we ought to behave, our, behave in the church of the living God. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Men, men don't by themselves know this. Now, the Spirit leads us and gives you a sense of propriety, even at the beginning. But this is to be matured into. A lot is at stake. One, the church is the body of Christ, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, the representative, if you will, the, uh, the carnal and not carnal in the sense of being of the flesh, but carnal meaning just in the body, uh, able to be seen of men and perceived, representative of Christ in the earth, as well as those that have gone on to heaven. The body of Christ is not divided. It's, um, it, it works in harmony. And so we ought to know how to behave ourselves in this context so that we ourselves are not a disruption or a hindrance or, or uh, causes problems in the working of the body, in the purpose of Christ as he operates in his body. Now, some men would look at this and they would, they would say, hmm, well, we've got to make some rules here. Well, God already has his rules. He, he already has the way he wants his body to function, and he doesn't need someone to enter uh, be an interloper here and, and uh, impose on men some kind of law which ultimately takes men's mind off of Christ and on to the rules that you're supposed to be keeping. So we're not, we're not praying for some kind of a regulatory agency here among men, but rather that, that the, the church, that we as members of that church may know how we ought to behave in the church. Well, the, it comprehends quite a few things. One, it, it comprehends that each one of us is conscious of the fact that we are one of many, that we ourselves are not the whole. Uh, men used to like to, to throw the word autonomous around. Well, there is no aut autonomy here. The... We're, we're not segmented, even, even as you look at the church in a broader scope. Some people, all they can think of when they, they think of the church is the local assembly with which they are most familiar. But the church is much larger than this. We are functioning within the context of many local assemblies, and the church of this generation, and the church of all ages, and the church in heaven and on earth, See what I'm saying here? This is big. This is very, very large. And it is, we, every member is set in the body as it has pleased him. And it, the body is fitly joined together. We're compacted together. We, we operate together in a harmony that shows forth the glory of Christ and of God the Father. So this is, this is a large request. We've, we've just got to, anybody who in, enters into this prayer has got to be able to rise up above the earth in order to get the gist of what's really being asked here. And whenever Paul finishes this out and says the church of the living God, that we ought to be able to behave ourselves as we ought in the house of God, the church of the living God, and says, reminds us that it's the pillar and ground of the truth. See, there's a reason for this harmony. The reason is the reality of what we have been made. And then also the function that the, the function has to show forth too. And if you have everybody running around promoting their own interest, not seeing themselves rightly as part of the, the whole of the body of Christ, not holding the head, uh, it, it's well, you're just not going to function as you ought to. You're not going to be beneficial. You're not going to 
to do yourself any favors as far as giving an answer to God in that day. But we want, we're, we're asking for the Lord to bless his people with an awareness of this and grace so that we can fit into this and actually accomplish his will in making a people for himself, for calling out a bride for his son, for making us, uniting us with himself in one spirit and making us his body. It should be apparent it should be apparent that we are not just a bunch of worldly people who have a particular interest in religion. There's got to be something about the, the people of God, the church of God, that sets her apart from everything that flesh has designed. And that is, that is part of the, the object of this prayer, that there would be a good understanding among all believers, all believers, all of us, the whole church, about how we ought to behave in the church of the living God. So who will lead us in that request? Brother Jeremy. Brother Judas. Sister Laura. All right. I'm going to turn to Psalm 101, verse 2, for our next request, that we would all resolve to behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when thou wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. There are those who, who think that the word perfect doesn't belong in the vocabulary of men. Well, in the vocabulary of flesh, it doesn't. But we're dealing with a powerful Savior and a perfect God and a perfect salvation. The perfections are of God, and they are, they are shown forth in his people according to his grace and mercy and purpose. So we're not, uh, we're not exalting the efforts of men in this prayer. That we would resolve, though. See, this doesn't just happen. This has got to be intentional on our part so that God will, God will meet us in this intention because it pleases him. We will resolve to behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way. Now, when we resolve to do that, we'll be looking for God's direction in leading us into this perfect way and keeping us in this perfect way. We're not going to be leaning to our own understanding. We're not going to be trying to uh, make this come to pass in our strength alone. But we are going to set our desire in that direction and resolve that this is what we want. Why do we want? This is where God is walking. These are the paths God walks, the, the paths of perfection, the, the paths of righteousness, doing what is right and what is good at all times, if David could resolve to do this, how much more those that are in Christ Jesus? If David could desire this, knowing what he did from the law, which did not minister grace, how much more the desire of those who have received grace through Jesus Christ and an abundance of truth? There... To, mu to whom much is given, much is required. And so this is, this is God's expectation of his people. God has not made the investment of Christ and himself for a people who don't even think like this. Our minds have been set on a different course as soon as we came into the kingdom. And that course is always upward and, and heavenward. And this is part, like, this is the manner of the kingdom. This is just how we're, how we're been created in Christ Jesus. So we want this fellowship, even now, with our Savior, that we would all resolve to behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way. Who will lead us in that request? Sister Barb. Sister Laura. 
All right. Finally, brethren, in Philippians 4, verse 12, we find our final request that we know how to be abased and how to abound. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This request will liberate us from the, from the um, influence of life to pull us in one direction or another. It, it, makes, it cuts us more free, if you will, of the influences of earth. And it also causes us in our conduct to independently of what men would call weal or woe, to always be operating by the principle of faith in, in Christ Jesus, that we would know how to be abased and how to abound. All right. That means that, that being in need or having an abundance is not what drives us. It means that whether we have little or we have much, we're, our minds are going to operate by the same principle how to be a good steward of what God has put in our hands, how to not be wasteful, how to, um, to use whatever it is, its influence, its power, its uh, whatever, f for kingdom purposes, to make sure that, that uh, the things that, that they're associated with are things that God can approve of, things that we can give a good answer for. See, God's going to give, he's going to ask us to give an answer for everything, not just the ones that had a lot. He's going to ask some people, what did they do with their poverty? He's going to ask other people, what did they do with their riches? But God is the main point of, of both of these. When, whenever Paul was able to suffer and to be hungry and to be full, he still never departed from the knowledge that God gave him whatever he had and that uh, he never he, he never complained against God's goodness. He always looked for what God was doing. See, this is, again, we have a wonderful example in the Apostle Paul. But he's not odd in the kingdom. This is the way the kingdom works. Whether there were times when Jesus was hungry. He didn't leave off the Father's business because he was hungry. In fact, even when he was hungry and tired and the apostles, they wanted him to eat something. He says, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. My meat is to do the Father's business. Well, see, this is the kind of mind that is in someone's, uh -huh. that, that uh, this request is answered in. And if they have a lot, then they're not distracted by their wealth, but rather they control their wealth according as God would, would dictate to them as far as knowing what is right and what is wrong and, and what is of the kingdom and what isn't. You understand what I'm saying? So we want, we want to ask this, that we, we would know both how to be abased and how to abound so that in everything we are found profitable servants and good stewards in God's kingdom. So who will lead us in that request? Brother Aaron. All right. Thank you very much, brethren. Follow our prayers.